Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, and also who also makes intercession for us. Okay, and the theme is no one, including ourselves, can accuse us. So let me explain here. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? Who can accuse us? Who can like bring a charge in, uh, uh, in a court to speak against us? It is God who justifies. It is God who, who calls us righteous, who makes us righteous. Who is he who condemns? Can anyone condemn us? It is Christ who died. Christ already died for us. And furthermore, it also risen, who is even at the right hand of God. He's sitting at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. So He is interceding for us. He is praying for us. So Christ has died for our sins. He has paid for the penalty of our sin. And He is risen from the dead. And he, he is at the right hand of God. And He is praying for us. So all of this will tell us that no one can accuse us. And uh, now people have the habit of accusing people. People have the habit of accusing us you know so and then and when people accuse us we also will accuse ourselves okay let me present this message first before i go into the writing because then then you can hear it uh maybe you can understand better this way okay this passage talks about no one can accuse us now then christians should be all free from guilt but it's not true there are many christians who have guilt attacking them and say, well, I have sinned against God, I have sinned against people, and someone says, I'm not doing well, I, 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 I'm not a good Christian, and then they feel very uh, down, they feel depressed, they feel uh, not accepted, and they even, they are afraid of God's accusation and punishing them. Many people are afraid of God's punishment now, God punishes those who don't repent. When we repent and want to obey God, even when we're not perfect, God is still happy with us and He will not punish us. So we want to, you know, want to continue to obey God more, to love God more, to obey God more. But even when we're not perfect, when we make some mistakes, we ask God to forgive us and, and, uh, and to protect us. So, we don't have to be afraid of people accusing us and saying that we're not doing well. So the reason why many people are, they don't have this um, free conscience because they are being attacked from outside, from other people, and also they themselves ac accuse themselves many, many times. But God's nature, God's nature is that He, when Jesus paid for our sins, he says that, that He has already paid for our sins. He died for our sins. Then all the sins are paid for. All the sins are paid for. So in Him, we, we don't owe Him anything when, Jesus, when we accept the gift of Jesus. Now, we do owe God because He has given us so much. But when we accept Jesus, then we have all things together with Him. Then we don't owe Him the debt of sin, that even though we have sinned, but we don't owe Him because all these are already covered by the blood of Jesus. It's already paid for by the blood of Jesus. We are all forgiven. So God doesn't want to condemn us. God accepts us totally. Whenever we sin, we just pray to God. God is very happy and He will for sure forgive us. And we don't have to worry. We don't have to accuse ourselves. And we can live in a a joyful uh, way in a, with free conscience. So how can we live with a free conscience? First, we really hold on to these Bible verses. Jesus has died for me. He has uh, risen from the dead. He has, he's now uh, at the right hand of God and praying for me. So all the sins are paid for. So first we trust in this and then we truly repent. But another thing is, we also want to turn away from all sins. Because when a Christian sins, especially when a, sis, a Christian sins intentionally, 
when he knows that it's sin and he still continues to sin, he gives the devil a chance to attack him. Satan will put a thought in him. You say that you believe in Jesus, but you don't really believe in Jesus because you continue to sin intentionally. You're not really repentant. So God doesn't forgive you. So Satan wants to put that thought into our heart. And also, when we sin, we lose the joy. Nobody will feel joyful when he has sinned. When we have, you know, imagine a Christian just has stolen something or he, a Christian uh, commit adultery uh, or he yells with his wife and children and fights with people, he will not have joy. So the sin will take the joy from him. So when we sin, we say, Lord, please forgive me. And also we want to say no to sins because we know that sins are destructive. And what can we do? Whenever we have sinful thoughts in our heart, immediately we'll say, the sins will destroy me. So I want to say no to the sins. I want to say no to the sins and turn away from the sin. When we have lust, immediately we'll say, I don't want to have lust because it will steal from me. When we have anger, we'll say, I don't want to have anger. I want to calm myself down, put down my burdens, relax, and instead of being angry, I will just talk peacefully with people to try to resolve a situation instead of being angry. So this is how we can take care of the sins whenever we have sinful thoughts. And then, we, and then we can appreciate God's work in our hearts, that He is working in my heart so that I can say no to sins. And God is very happy with us. So we can tell ourselves, God is very happy with us. So I'm, uh, God is pleased with me when I repent and when I obey Him. And then we will feel joyful. And then we continue to praise God and then we continue to have this joy. Okay, so here now we look at the, uh, the writing, the theme, no one including ourselves can accuse us. Interpretation, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's a rhetorical question. That means its purpose is not to get an answer, but to create a dramatic effect to make people think. So a uh, rhetorical question is something like that people know the obvious answer. For instance, uh, uh, a person has the sin, has lust in his heart, and then the, the pastor knows about it, and then he will ask him, uh, "Aren't you married?" So, the man knows that he's married. The pastor is not saying, "You know, do you know whether you're married or not?" Think, are you married or not? He's not asking for an answer. He's just making him wake up to his condition that he's married. Aren't you married? So that's a rhetorical question. So who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's a rhetorical question. That is a question that has the obvious answer. No one can bring a charge against God's elect. But it's to uh, create a dramatic effect. Who can bring a charge or accuse God's elect? The obvious answer is no, no one can. So if no one can accuse us, why do we need to be afraid of people accusing us? So we don't have to be afraid of people who accuse us. Two, no one can bring a charge against God's elect because God justifies us. God calls us righteousness. That is, He calls us righteous. Who is He who condemns? Christ has died and is risen and is at the right hand of God and inter in interceding for us. <clears throat> so Christ has died for our sins and is risen to justify us and ex exalted the right hand of God. So He has total victory. He is interceding for us so He cares for us and prays for us so He definitely will bless, will bless us. So he definitely is, he wants to bless us. He wants to help us. He wants to do wonderful things for us. <clears throat> Many Christians are affected by accusation from others and from themselves. So this is uh, negative examples. This is the intro. People easily accuse others and themselves. Because the culture of most people is a culture of accusation. Most people like to accuse other, others. 
they like to say you don't do well husband accuse the wife and the wife accuse the husband this morning I uh, counsel a couple uh, who are serving God and you know they don't accuse uh, intentionally but they just say something like why did you do that and uh, or just say something is not right and then it caused the other person to feel accused so, so we, we should be very careful if we see any problem of someone instead of accusing them we can say um, I want to talk about this with you uh, to find a solution I noticed that there is a problem let us think about what we can do instead of accusing the other person and say you have done something wrong why did you do that why what is the problem here for instance many wives take care of the children and the children still don't obey and then the husband come home and say you did not do a good job so that's accusation but instead the husband can say how how we can discipline our children better how we can teach our children be better how we can raise them, them up in God's way that is a way to raise up issues without ac accusing the other person so people easily accuse others and we feel hurt when we are accused we feel rejected and cut down so it will bring all kind of negative feelings and it will cause people to fight against each other and then we feel despised and we lose strength we might even think that God is accusing us God doesn't accuse us it's Satan who is accusing the brothers day and nights and we continue to accuse ourselves even more frequently than other people so when someone accuses us one time we might accuse us many many times many days many months and many years some of you might have this experience that we remember how people accuse us years ago and we keep accusing ourselves and then B God's grace Jesus came to take away all our accusation so that's God's grace he, he Jesus died for us and take away all our accusation Jesus did not just forgive us at a moment of, of conversion Romans 3.33 says that no one can accuse us anymore because Jesus has justified us and is praying for us when we sin and we sincerely repent God will for sure forgive us so we don't need to continue to feel guilty so there is no need to feel, continue to feel guilty we just say Lord please forgive me and I really hate the sin I, I want to turn away from the sin I don't want to sin anymore that is true repentance that we want to turn away from the sin I don't want to sin anymore I know that sins are destructive so I turn from sin to righteousness and I know that God for sure will forgive me so I don't have to feel bad anymore God even covers us with the robe of righteousness Isaiah 61 10 so we are adorned like a bridegroom or a bride okay this is the verse I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels so here the book of Isaiah he says that I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God I'm very happy because of my God because he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and cover me with a robe of righteousness so he has covered me with the clothing of righteousness and salvation he has covered me he has covered my sins the robe of righteousness is not just covering our sin but he puts the righteousness of God onto us the righteousness of Jesus he has he has fulfilled the law and his righteousness will be put upon us as a bridegroom decks himself with the ornaments so when we have the the garments of salvation and righteousness then we'll look like a bride or a bridegroom that will be beautiful like a bride or bridegroom 
So when we have the righteousness of God upon us, then we will be adorned with the righteousness of God and we will be beautiful in the sight of God. So that is what this verse says. That is not just, Jesus did not just forgive our sins, but He covers us with a robe of righteousness. He adds something to us. His righteousness, the Jesus' righteousness that He has fulfilled the law will be covered upon us that in the sight of God we are like Jesus that we have fulfilled the law so that's how beautiful we are when we have the forgiveness of Jesus Christ see why many Christians have problems believing that no one can accuse them why don't they believe that and they think that people are accusing them and continue to accuse ourselves because we are used to the culture of accusation so because some people they always accused we live in a culture of accusation we're used to accusing others at the same time we are used to accusing ourselves we too will ac accuse ourselves we unconsciously believe that this is the norm we think that this is normal for people to accuse each other and this is damaging to us and to the body of Christ when we accuse other people and accuse other uh, ourselves so understand when we understand this we know why okay and then there is a reminder from the law. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 15. So we don't receive a spirit of bondage, the spirit of a slave, but we receive the spirit of adoption, that we are adopted as children of God, that we can cry out to God, Abba, Father. So, people continue to be affected by accusation from others and from themselves are living with a spirit of bondage. They are like slaves. And they have no strength. They continue to think that they are too bad to be used by God. They think that they are useless. They, God will not like them. But the Bible says that we have the spirit of adoption. When we trust in Jesus, when we ask God to forgive us, that He really forgives us, and then we have the spirit of adoption, then we can be free. So, but when people don't believe that, then they are living in a spirit of bondage. So there are many Christians who live in accusation of others and themselves. They continue to accuse themselves, then they are suffering. So that's a warning from the Bible. Don't live like that. Don't live like a slave. Don't live like a criminal. When people don't repent of the sins, they will also be attacked by guilt continu continuously. So another reason is that people don't repent of their sins, and then they will be accused uh, by their guilt feeling. Okay, how to live without accusation? First, forgiveness and righteousness are gifts already given to us by God. We just repent, trust in Jesus, forgi Jesus' forgiveness, and believe the promise in Romans 8.33, we just repent, trust in Jesus, and then He will forgive us. Two, we examine ourselves and find out how we have believed in accusation. We want to break all the beliefs of accusation. So sometimes we have the habit of accusing others and accusing ourselves. So we want to break this habit. I don't want to accuse myself of the mistakes I made before, of the sins I've committed before. I want to turn away from the sins. I want to break the habits. I want to break this accusation that will say, Lord, help me, help me. I know the destructiveness of sins. Now, there are many Christians who continue this uh, uh, vicious cycle. They continue sin, they continue sin, and then what happens is they go down more and more. They continue to have guilt, and they have guilt, and then they feel guilty, and then they sin more, they sin more and they feel more guilty. So they, it continues to go down, a downward spiral. Instead, we'll say, yes, I know that. Sins, when I commit sin, it will cause me to accuse myself. The sins will accuse me. So we know that sins are destructive. We want to say no to sins. We want to turn away from sin and God will for sure forgive me. So that is motivation with grace, okay? That God wants to forgive me. God wants me to be free of guilt. God wants me to live like 
children, not like slaves. So there's no reason to continue to sin. Now, instead of saying, if you continue to sin, you'll have accusation. Now, this is the law. We, we have this part. We can tell people. When we continue to sin, the sin will continue to accuse us. But we know that. When we repent and turn away from the sins, then we have freedom. We have a free conscience. Conscience. We, we, no one can accuse us, so we can feel joyful and peaceful and happy. So that is motivation by the grace of God. We don't just tell people, now this is the way of the law. You have to repent. If you don't repent, God will punish you, so you must repent. If you don't repent, God will steal, I mean, uh, Satan will steal from you. He will steal everything from you. You lose everything. So you must repent now. That is warning from the, Bible, uh, from the law only. We don't want to just use the law. We want to tell people, God is very happy to forgive you. God sees that you are being controlled by sin. God is sad for you. He wants to rescue you. He wants to take you out from the burden of sin. He wants to set you free to, so you can live like children of God, so you can enjoy God. So when we trust in God and turn away from sin, God is very happy and He will give us a free conscience. He'll give us uh, peace and joy so that we're not attacked by accusation or guilt anymore. And whenever we are attacked by guilt, we say, the Lord forgives me so I can put down all my sins. I, I can put down all my guilt. And then we want to hate sins and turn away from sins. Because when a person sins habitually, no matter how much he believes in forgiveness, he will still feel guilty. So if a person sins all the time, he will continue to feel guilty. So we must turn away from the sins and say sorry and ask God, to forgive us and we know that God will forgive us and then we can be free and joyful and we don't have to accuse ourselves anymore. So, um, the challenge, we all suffer from accusation. Do we want to be free from accusations? It is a free gift. It can bring us freedom and give us strength and joy. It's unnecessary to live under accusation. You can take this freedom now. So do you want to live in freedom? Do you want to turn away from your sins and live that in a way that believing that God really forgives us and there is no need for any accusation? So now I, I want to explain again the difference between motivation by the law only and motivation by grace and law. Okay, Motivation by law only would be saying if you sin, God will punish you, Satan will steal from you, and you lose everything, so repent. Now this is just motivation from the law. And we want to motivate from God's grace. God is a gracious God. God is a God of forgiveness. He understands that Christians, many Christians are weak. That we can go into sin and are weak. And then they are attacked by accusation. God understands that. So that's one nature of God. God understands the sinners. He understands the problem of the sinners. So that is why there are serious sinners. The woman who was caught in adultery when he, she was brought to Jesus, Jesus did not accuse her. He understands that. She was suffering under sin. She was under the bondage of sin and she has no strength. So Jesus will forgive her willingly so that she can be set free. So she can be set free. That's the motivation from God. God wants to forgive us so that we can be set free. This is grace. This is what God does for us. So that's the point. What God does for us to free us from sin, to take out, uh, uh, free us from accusation, to assure us of forgiveness that we have the value of a child of God, that we are like a child of God. Uh, we are totally a child of God in the sight of God. So that is motivation by God's grace. He is happy to forgive you. When you come to God, He will he'll forgive you. And then at the same time, we can put in the warning from the law. 
But if you don't repent and you think that you can continue to sin and then you come back to ask God to forgive you, then you continue to have accusation in your heart and you continue to feel guilty. And then you will lose strength and then you will um, then uh, that you know you lose the freedom of God and the blessings of God. So do you want to live like that? Or do you want to live in the joy of the Lord to be blessed by God all the time? And then you have strength and the blessings of God. So we want to motivate people with God's grace first. And then we still remind them with the law. Okay? So now the first passage we talk about today, let me demonstrate also how different it is just to with, uh, do it with the law. Okay, this passage here, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but He delivered Him for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Now this passage, if a person uses the law only, he will say, God has given you all things, and then if you don't believe that, and you don't follow God, you don't obey God, then you don't receive all the blessings. So it's just telling people, if you don't do it, then you don't get it. But, Motivation with the, with the grace of God will be like this. God has already given you the gift. He has already given you Jesus Christ. Together with Him, He gives us all things. And when you trust in Him and obey Him and love Him, you receive all these blessings. Because the Bible doesn't just say you believe in Jesus and then from now on you have all the blessings from God. The Bible says when you love God, then what is prepared for you is something your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, and the human mind cannot think of. So the Bible promises blessings to those who trust in God and obey God and love God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So God wants to give those, us those blessings. When we trust in God and, and obey Him and have a close relationship with God, then we have all these blessings that God has already prepared for us. God wants to give us all these blessings. So, there's no reason to lose these blessings. Do you want to take it? You just take it by faith and say, God, thank you, thank you, thank you, I will take this gift. So, that is motivation by God's grace. It's instead of just using the law. Now, I'll use an, another example. For instance, to motivate people to have joy in the Lord. That uh, we motivate with uh, uh, now, if people motivate with the law, it will be like this. The Bible tells us to rejoice in the Lord, and you don't rejoice. You're always frowning, you're unhappy, you're complaining, and then you lose all, all the blessings of God. You'll be suffering. So that is motivation from the law. But motivation by grace and the law together will be like this. God is a joyful God. He wants you to enjoy His joy. He wants you to Live in joy that because He is preparing everything for us. He, is, he wants to bless us. He has everything prepared for us. He wants to bless us. He wants to give us strength. He wants us to enjoy everything we have from God. And so when we trust in God, we can enjoy His joy and we can enjoy life. We can enjoy God. And then we live as joyful Christians. Isn't that wonderful? Do you want to live in joy? And then some Christians don't take it seriously and then they don't live in joy and they just look at the problems. Do you want to live like that? Now this is a reminder from the law. If you just look at the problems, then you suffer. You have no joy. But if you look at God's grace all the time, you thank God for His grace and you trust in Him and you believe that God is blessing me, God is blessing me, God is helping me, then you'll be enjoying Him all the time. Okay, so I hope you all understand that. And if you have any problem, please send me the questions and then please send me the assignments so that you practice that. It's for your good. So that you're motivating people and then they will see God is good. Yes, I want to obey Him and love Him and serve Him. Then your church will be full of people who serve God and love God. And they're not put under pressure to serve God, but they enjoy serving God. They, they, you know, you can teach them whatever little things you do for Him. When you put the chairs in place, you clean up the church, you help other Christians, you help the newcomers, God is very happy and God will bless you and he will, your life will be strengthened. So 
then we can motivate people like that. And and then there are some people doing that, and then you say, wow, this person, he is so faithful, he is doing all these things for God, God is happy with him. So we can be like that too. So that is motivating people with grace, mainly. And then with the law as a reminder. Okay, let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you because you are a gracious God. You are a wonderful God. You are full of goodness. You have all kinds of good things you want to give us. You want us to live in, a, uh, in a, your joy, in your blessings. We want, you want us to enjoy life and enjoy God all the time. Thank you, Lord. You're so wonderful. We enjoy you. We love you. We like you. Please help us to put down all our burdens. Now, please stand up to relax ourselves in the sight of God and pray together. Lord Jesus, take away our burdens. Take away all our sorrow, all our worries. Lord, provide for us, please. Bless America. I'm sorry. Bless Africa. Lord, bless Africa. Bless the people and bless the world. Everyone in America and everywhere in Europe and everywhere. God bless us all. Give us strength from you. Give us joy from you. Be with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're so wonderful. You're so wonderful. You're a great God. Hallelujah. We enjoy you and we want to love you. We want to trust in you. We want to serve you. We want to glorify you. We want to tell people about Jesus because Jesus is a wonderful God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you are the only true God. Hallelujah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the only true God. Uh, only true one God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, God bless you all. And you can send me questions and send me the photos in the photo group. Okay, God bless you. Bye-bye. Please send me the questions and assignments. Okay.